Okay, so um, today's session is called Structural Tectonics, and we're going to look at the railway engine depot in Basel by Herzog de Muron. You were there? Did you go to it? Fantastic. Great. Excellent. I was there a couple of weeks ago. Been, been there a few times. Great. Um, so, that's the site, and um, that's the building highlighted in red there. And I, I was really drawn to this building um, a number of years ago. It was one of Herzog de Muron's sort of earlier works. And I, I was really kind of intrigued because it was a fairly young practice, and they were being asked to design a, effectively a shed for a railway um, for the railway company. And, um, and I, I was kind of really impressed by the kind of quality and, and the, the, the sort of tectonic um, complexity that they brought to this building, which is essentially just a shed. And you'll see when we look through it, it's, you know, it's not really made of anything other than shed materials. They've, they've not really got much to play with other than the normal kind of pallet of materials, probably the, the fairly normal cost constraints of a shed. But I think they've made something really kind of spectacular and, um, you know, what must be a really great place to work in as far as sheds go. Okay, so let's have a look. And, and I thought, you know, maybe quite, it could be quite relevant to some of your projects now. If you are, you might end up with programs for your projects that are not, you know, not wildly exciting. You know, a shed, a train shed, it's not wildly exciting, but people are going to work there. People are going to spend years and years of their lives in that building. So, you know, for me as an architect, your role is to make the best work environment for those people that you can, even though it's just a shed. And, and this is why sometimes you might hear me say I'm not, I can't be too interested in, for example, the choice of sites for a student project, because ultimately whatever site you have to work on as an architect, surely you'll do the best you can for that site, whether there's a better site or, you know, or not. Um, so this is the site for this, this building. Um, it's, it's really, it's kind of strange, strange part of the city. It's quite difficult to get to, we found. Um, and, you know, it's kind of locked in by all these tr train lines. It's, you know, it's not like, it's not a wonderful location. It's not really highly visible. Um, let's have a look at it. The first shot I've got is an interior shot, I believe. No, it's not. The second shot is. Okay. Um, but I thought this shot was quite good because it, it kind of, for me, it captures the, the sort of elegance uh, that they've achieved from this building and, and the, the use of the structure to make something quite special. So what you see in the building this is pretty much what the building is. It's a big, it's a series of concrete walls, some of which have windows in, and it's a series of trusses that span between those concrete walls, and the trusses are clad in a glass plank, um, kind of reglet product, um, and that's it really. That's pretty much the building. That's what you, that's what you get in the building. And when you look inside, that's the kind of quality of space and light that they've managed to achieve from these sort of shed um, parameters, which I think, you know, for me, it's, it's way over the kind of quality you would get from a standard, if you look at a standard shed in, in the UK, for example, with a, probably with a steel portal frame, and, and you probably would get some um, translucent polycarbonate glazing in the roof if you're lucky, but, you know, generally very kind of dark, uh, not have a kind of, the structure is very banal often. But you compare it with this where, for me, the, the building speaks all about the language of this, this big truss. The big truss acts as the big the device for bringing the light in. And then when we look again outside um, on the building, you'll see that this truss defines the elevations. And this truss gives the building its shape. It gives it a you know, really interesting form, quite, quite distinctive even from a distance. So we look at through, we're going to look through some of the images. Some of the images are mine, some of them are from uh, the El Croquis journal. Okay, you can probably tell which ones are mine. 
because they're a bit crummy. Okay, but again, they're kind of real photos. They're not the, you know, the El Cro This is an El Croqui image. You know, it's completely empty. Nobody's there. They've obviously got the camera, big medium format camera on a tripod, all beautifully perspective corrected. It's not really how we perceive buildings. Um, and oh, sorry, just go back. And then what we're going to do later on in the session is we're going to have a little, little bit of drawing, looking at the the kind of structural principles of the building on, a, on the whole the building scale. And then we're going to start to look at some of the, interrogate some of the details relating to this truss and the glazing of it. Okay. And as usual, it'll probably take us about an hour and a half, an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and a half. See how it goes. Okay. So that's a view we took recently. Um, this was with, with my studio. Uh, that's a view showing the sort of one of the train, one of the sheds, one of the bays, with this repeated truss, very translucent, you know, even on this fairly sort of, fairly dull day when we were there, you're getting some light coming through the trusses from both sides, so you've got this sort of quality of the, the um, opaque concrete, you've got the black windows here, which you, you can see, see in when you get a bit closer, but then you've actually got light coming through this truss. That's a view from the from the other end, and you see the kind of quality, the materials. It's very simple. It's you know it's it's um, in situ concrete. The the window frames are all completely flush. There's no there's no detailing. Um, steel doors, very very industrial, and there's a, a very simple aluminium uh, coping over the top. It's the same kind of same kind of view. And that's a view um, looking from the side where you see this rhythm of the trusses. I mean also with it being an industrial building, what I notice is they, they have changed this building over time. Um, and so there are, I think, I'm not sure if that bit there was original or not on the end. There's some, some sections that I think have been added to the roof, but the building can kind of cope with that because it, it never started its life as a kind of pure, beautiful form. It started its life as a fairly sort of messy shape, which you'll see when I, when I show you the plans. A few along the back. This is, this is clearly an addition here, this steel, steel box here. That's the, um, that's the sort of close-up of the, the windows. And also the, there's a, I think the building has a real sort of sympathy with the scale of the trains. It all, f I mean obviously it's designed for the trains to go in, but it, it just for me, it just had a feel like the kind of spacing, the rhythm of the, the trusses, the bays. It's all kind of related to a train size. That's the uh, the roofscape view. So what you might notice is that the the trusses, these are the trusses, that they do stagger. So from from the different shed to shed, they kind of stagger, which I guess um, partly it's um, a structural um, reason so that you don't have the two trusses bearing at the same point. Um, also it maybe gives a bit more interest to the roofscape and maybe it's partly to let you have this access through. The roof is a sheet metal, I, th I think it's a zinc cap to the top of the trusses and then it's uh, it's an inverted roof with a, with a um, with some sort of pebbles on it and, and a bit of a sedum, which is not really growing very well, but it's a it's an insulated roof with a membrane and then a, and then a uh, a covering on it. That's the side view again. The um the insulated the, the insulated glass planks around the trusses are very effective because um, 
They have a thermal property because they're a, they're a sort of double skin glass plank. They're very strong. They're very robust. The UK product is called Reglit. Um, if you were interested in looking that up. I'm not sure if this is Reglit or whether there's a sort of Swiss version. I'm not sure. Um, it's translucent. It's not transparent, but it's translucent. So you get light through it. You get shadows through it, but you don't get a completely clear view through it. Um, which I'm sure helps because the glass probably gets quite mucky inside and outside, but the, this, the, the kind of reglit planks are very forgiving. Even if it's a little bit dirty, it doesn't really show it. Um, it's also frameless because the planks, because they interlock into each other, you don't need to have a frame at the join between the, the glass planks. And as we'll see when we draw it, the detail at the sort of head and the, and the sill is, is very simple. So that's the view inside again. And just to point out, before we start drawing it, some of the other materials, um, you've got a profiled steel sheet deck at the top of the truss. You've got a profiled steel sheet deck spanning um, the other direction, sorry, the, at the base of the truss. And you just make it out there. Between the trusses, the, the the flat bit of roof between the trusses hangs off the underside of the truss there. And I'll draw that in a moment, but that section of roof is, although the, 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 the sheet is spanning that direction, the main, the primary structure is spanning that direction, hung off the trusses. And as you can probably see, that's a fairly slender bit of steel there. Um, but all it's supporting is the roof and a bit of snow load, so it obviously doesn't need to be too substantial. And I think the, you know, the truss is, because it's so deep, the actual members of the truss are not too thick, not too large. I mean, when we draw it, they are actually, you know, they're pretty, they are pretty sizable bits of steel, but in proportion to the building, I think when you look at it there, it doesn't feel kind of over-dominated by the steelwork. So there's another view inside with this repeated truss all the way down. And there's, there's one of those windows in the concrete wall. On the inside, you can just make, probably just make it out there, the concrete is clad in an acoustic product. It's a, it's a sort of wood chip board product, um, just, I think just to absorb some of the sound inside. You, oh, you can see it. You see it here, uh, not very clear for you, is it? But it's just stuck to the concrete with little, um, with little drilled fixings, with little round discs that just hold it in place. But there's no sort of, and there's no intention to finish it off. It's just a, you know, it's just an acoustic product. And that's a, another view of a truss. I mean, you can see the services. The services just hang. You know, there's no, there's no concern about hiding the services. It, you know, it's, it needs to be flexible. They need to change it. So all of the, all of the wiring, all of the, the ventilation duct work, it's just surface fixed where you can see it. Generally in, in galvanized steel, which is kind of sympathetic with the, the rest of the materials. So that's the plan, or part of the plan, anyway. So you've got these big, long sheds. This is the this line here is the concrete, the concrete wall, and again, and then another another concrete wall here, and they just repeat that, and then spanning between here are the trusses, which we'll see in a moment. So that's a roof plan. So that's the span of the truss spanning between the two concrete walls. And then in between the trusses here, you've got these steels that span across like that. And then that, the profile steel deck spans that way between. So that profile steel deck is not spanning concrete wall to concrete wall. It's just spanning 
beam to beam. So that, you know, this sort of common idea that you, when you have a roof, you break down the span. So you have primary, secondary, tertiary, often in different directions. And that's the long section, and I'll, I've got to I'll zoom in in a moment. And if you just look on the top here, that's your typical sort of arrangement of trusses. And here where it looks like they're a double, that's because you're seeing um, this truss you're seeing in the background in elevation. And, you know, it's pretty simple. There is a, there is a basement level in places. That's the section looking the other way. So there's your typical truss span there. The truss on the, um, the southern building is slightly uh, longer. The span is slightly longer. But that's your sort of typical, typical bay. And there is an office building here, which we're not, we're not really looking at that today. And that's the close-up of the, the kind of typical section, truss here, steel spanning between the truss, flat roof in between, and that's your sort of train level down there. That's the typical truss, um, looking at it from the side. So it's an eight bay, eight bay truss, as you can see. I think it's about three meters high. So from from eaves here to the spring point of the truss is about three meters, and then that bears onto this in situ reinforced concrete wall. We'll draw that in a moment. And then this is the. The typical end detail, which we'll, we'll draw, it's not very clear on there, but this is the condition where the truss bears onto the concrete wall, and that's one of the, the other details that we'll draw. Okay. Any questions on the building or comments, observations before we start looking at it in detail? Everybody familiar with this building from before? No? I guess it's kind of before your time in a way. What, what I mean by that is when this building was built, you were not in architectural education. So you're probably more likely to see things that are built while you're looking at magazines and so on. Okay. Right, so what I want to do first of all is just to expand a little bit on that, um, that kind of primary structural relationship. So I'm just going to draw a quick 3D here, just to try and get that idea across. So we start with the retaining wall. So that retaining wall is cast directly onto the foundations. So although I'm drawing it all as one, in reality, um, there probably would be some joins, joins here when they're casting it. Okay. I, I am recording this session, by the way, so um, you know, there will be a video available. And I'm, I've got a cold, so apologies, my voice keeps sort of dropping out a bit. <clears throat> okay. Okay. 
So that's kind of, in essence, the concrete work. Although it's got some, it has got some windows in it here. But that's the kind of um, kind of principle that they you have a big, strong concrete box connected to the foundations, and obviously that's uh, the dimensions are all related to a train, which I will sort of try and draw a train in section, something like just something like that. Ooh. I guess a train that's sort of size anyway. can't remember how many trains you get in each bay. You get two or four, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so that's the, that's the basic sort of concrete work. And then if we get a bit of trace. So then what you've got quite simply is it's a really, you know, that's why I really like this building. I think it's a very simple concept that you then take these box trusses, which are about, as I say, about three meters. Drawn, drawn that a bit wrong, there, actually. They're about three meters square. That's the sort of idea, and then um, these trusses are braced in in all directions. They've 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 got sort of slimmer steel members where they're just cross bracing. They've got slightly thicker members in places, but basically just to stop the the truss twisting, it's it's braced all over the place basically. Okay, so let me just. Um, make that clear. So that's your that's your trust. And then I'm not sure what spacing they're at. I think they're at about six meters, six meters apart. So if we go, if we go six meters away, and then we have another one. So there's your there's your next truss, and if we just put a few dimensions on. I must say I haven't, I haven't checked if these are actually three and six, but I could imagine that that's the kind of proportion that would that would look about right. So I'll just I'll put that on, even though I'm not entirely sure, but I think around about three meters and six meters. So that's your, you've got these trusses spanning across now, and they, they just repeat and repeat. And then between, we've then got, I should draw these, we've then got the, um, the steels that span between the trusses, just going to check those. Yeah. 
and those steels span on every, they, they join at every um, node on the truss. So what you've actually got um, is a small, small little hanger on, on each of those nodes on there. And then that has the steel beam hung off it. So they then span that way. Okay. So they're spanning between. So we've got we've got this idea, as, as I say, of sort of primary, primary span, spanning between the walls, secondary span spanning between the trusses and then tertiary which is the metal deck profiled metal deck spanning between these cross beams so if i just draw that um that metal deck on so that metal deck sits sits in here And spans that direction between those steels and then there's also a metal deck on top of the truss okay so you know I think a really incredibly simple elegant structure also I mean I imagine I don't I don't know this for a fact but you would imagine with these trusses that you could easily manufacture them off-site. Um, I mean, they probably would fit on the back of a train, I guess. I'm not entirely sure, but don't see why not. Um, I mean, they're only they're only bolted together anyway. But you know, there would be there could be some sense in making these things off-site just to speed up the process when you get to site. Um, okay. Any questions on on that? All fairly straightforward. I mean, I, I generally, you know, I quite like buildings that you can understand, that you can you can look at the structure and, and in a short time you can sort of appreciate why things are working the way they are, why things are spanning that way, how they work. And I, I think this building's really great for that. And then the just to put the the glass, so the reglet or the, the glass planks anyway. Is in is in the sides here, and in yes, in the sides here. Yeah. So that that glass product then is in all the sides of the truss. Much better than skylights because it's vertical, so it isn't going to leak. Um, it's much easier to clean it. Skylights, you know, they are prone to, to leak leaking. They, they can be more difficult to. Uh, to clean, you've got problems with skylights that if they're fragile, there's a risk of an operative falling through the thing when they're cleaning it. So you end up with you know, big protection around it. They, they can be a real problem, actually. Whereas vertical glazing, you know, been doing that for thousands of years, it, it works. Um, you know, much, much better solution, really. Okay. And then, obviously, that those trusses just repeat and repeat and repeat all the way down the building okay so let's have a look at that um, at that end detail in fact I better, better turn the paper that way um, I'm going to draw this at one to five, but what it does mean, because of the scale of this, it's um, it, it won't fit on the page. Um, so it won't uh, it won't fit on the page as a full section. Okay, so I'll probably have to have a break line here, which I normally try not to do because you lose that sense of scale. But I think for this, it's probably worth 
doing that. So let's start with the in fact let's start with a grid line. That, that's probably a good point. So let's just I'm going to use a color here, but just to keep me nicely lined up, I'm just going to draw that, that grid which would go through the concrete wall and it would go through the steel. Um, okay, just as a, as a start point then. And then we'll draw that lower, lower steel number. I'll try and leave enough space here. So it's a 200 by 300 rectangular hollow section. So 200. If you're um, in your own projects, if you're drawing any steel work, just go to the Tartar TATA steel website and just look up their standard section tables. Okay, they're all on there because steel um, steel comes in certain sizes. You know, so you know, it's a it's a product. So it looks a bit it looks a bit silly sometimes if you have in your project drawing steel sizes that don't exist. You know, like wow. Well, um, so you know, just go and have a look at the product sizes, and then you can you can choose which kind of steel you want to use. I'm sure none of you are using steel because that's terrible material. <laughs> I mean, steel is a you know is a really high high energy, high carbon material, it's not, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be your first choice. I guess here it's a, you know, it's a train shed and, and it's probably kind of appropriate. Okay. So that's your 200 by 300. It looks a bit squashed on here. Oh, no, not so squashed on there. It looks squashed on there anyway. So that's your lower um, steel member. And then the top of this truss is a steel universal beam, which I will draw up here. Trying to leave enough space. Okay. And I don't actually know what section size this is, so I'm just drawing it to look about the right size. And again, if you're drawing universal beams or universal columns, just um, have a look on those section tables, get the section sizes, and try and draw it, well, better than I've drawn that one, to be honest. Just try and draw it to look like a hot rolled steel, okay? Because, because these steels are formed hot, they're rolled, you do end up with curved you know, the curved connections here, um, and, and it just looks sort of wrong if you, if you draw a steel like, oops, like that, with just completely, you know, sharp connections. It just doesn't look like a piece of steel, because steel doesn't look like that. So just try and, you know, I mean, I've, that one's really badly drawn, the one I've done there, but... Just try and make it look like a real piece of steel. It really lifts your quality of your drawings. Okay. Not that any of you have got steel anyway. Of course. You've, all, you've all got timber. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the top, the top and the bottom of the, of the truss. And the important thing to note is that we've, we've broken this drawing here. Okay, so the scale is now kind of uh, wrong in terms of proportion. <coughs> okay, so that's that there. And then we've got the concrete retaining wall, uh, sorry, the reinforced concrete wall, which is pretty, pretty thick. And that's down here. So 
that's the concrete retaining wall. Um, and the only thing to note about that is that the, the arises are chamfered off here and here. Um, generally, when you're casting in situ concrete, if you, if you put a little timber chamfer in the formwork and you deliberately take that corner off, it's better because otherwise it tends to break, it either tends to break off or you lose it when you strip the formwork. So in a way, it's kind of better to have a deliberate little 45 degree chamfer on your concrete than a jagged, broken edge. Okay. If you want to see the jagged, broken edge, go to Jessup West, because they, they forgot that, and all, the, all of those corners are all broken off, um, which apparently, according to um, Louisa Hutton, was intentional. Okay, that's what, that's what she told Arabs, but, uh, oops, I don't really believe that. Okay, so there's our concrete wall, truss, uh, and they, they have a slightly, it's a slightly sort of complicated way of connecting it, to be honest. Um, so, what I need to do is just get these things in line here. So I'm going to just draw. I'm going to draw the um, the glass plank in next because I want to make sure that I get that in in line. The, the key thing, if I just bring the the image over, the key thing that that they've achieved here is you notice the concrete face here is flush with the glass, um, and then you just have this very minimal trim along the top of the concrete, a little shadow gap and the trim at the bottom of the glass, and then a very similar uh, effect at the top. So that's why I'm just being a bit careful here to make sure that I line up that glass with the, the concrete. The, the detail I'm referring to is not actually quite the same detail, so I'm just slightly modifying it. So let's just draw our, our glass in for the sake of it. So that's the, that's the base of the glass plank, and I've drawn it flush with the concrete, because I know that's where it needs to be. I'm not entirely sure how high that should end up, but we'll figure that out in a minute. And then that, we know that goes up to the roof. So I'm just going to draw that in, but not finish it off, because I, because I don't quite know yet where my roof will end up here. So I'll just leave that unfinished. There's that glass. Um, maybe we should hatch that a bit. We'll just put a bit of blue hatch in that just to make it clear that that's meant to be that kind of frosted glass plank. So then at the bottom, we've got an aluminium channel, an aluminium extrusion rather, which would be, this would be a sort of proprietary product that you would buy with the glass plank. So it's not, it's not something you'd need to sort of have, have made up. It would be, it would be part of the um, product system. So that, that trim, glass sits in that trim, and then we have this little shadow gap, 
and a thin aluminium trim which then sits on top of the concrete. And this is the shadow gap that's created there. And the shadow gap, I think, is very effective because any, any slight unevenness in that concrete or the steelwork, you know, anything that's not quite flat, you just sort of lose it in that little shadow zone. Now, measuring it, it looks, yeah, it looks like about a sort of 50 millimeter shadow gap, which might seem like quite a lot. But when you then look at the look at the photograph again, on the on the scale of the building, you, you don't really appreciate that 50 mil. You know, it appears very thin. And looking at the picture there, this looks like just a grey polyester powder coated aluminium trim. Okay, nothing nothing flash, just very you know very sort of standard stuff. Okay. It's not very clear here, but uh, I'll just figure this out. In terms of connecting this steelwork to the concrete, I mean, the detail I've got is it's not entirely clear what's going on, but it appears that they've, they've got a, a steel plate. which is bolted down which is bolted down into the concrete and it's not entirely clear but but that may have flush recessed bolt heads in there with a sort of allen allen socket head cap that would be that would be nice and neat, uh, and then I'm slightly making this up to be honest because it's not all the information is not all here. But there's a vertical plate which is welded welded to this base plate. Focus that. And then, and I must admit, this is where I am making it up because it's it's sort of incomplete here. Two. That makes that a bit bigger. Two plates welded to the underside of that steel. which can then accept a bolt through the middle. Uh, so that's just bolted together like that. So that's the that's the steel connected up. And looking at the detail, it looks like they're probably not too bothered about the fact that you see the edge of this steel plate. That it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an industrial building. Um, the gap under this plate is to allow some packing on site. So when they when they bring the um, bring the steel work to site. Um, they'll, they'll start to align on top of the concrete. They, nowadays, it's incredibly accurate. They're using laser, laser surveying. They will want that steel millimeter accurate nowadays. And so, because the concrete might be doing that, might be a bit up and down, they need to pack it 
to get that steel in exactly the right place. And it's quite incredible now with, with the steel work that, you know, forget, it doesn't matter if your foundations are slightly in the wrong place, that steel work will be bang on the right spot. You know, in, in the air, it will be in the right place. Really, really accurate. Okay, that's that. That's on there. And then we need to look at the, the junction of the roof. Okay, so we've got the profiled, the profiled steel deck, which because this is an end condition, is spanning this way. Okay, so typically this would be about probably about 130 mil deep, or maybe up to maybe 200 mil. Hundred. I'll draw that as 150 mil deep, like that. Which, if you were to look at that in the section the other way, would look something like something like this. Okay. So it's a. It's a, it's a bent steel sheet, profiled steel sheet, and by having all these folds in it, it becomes very rigid in terms of spanning. So very effective for spanning that, that distance for, you know, for a very thin piece of steel, effectively. Um, now, because this is a roof, uh, th there's not a concrete deck on this, but you can, have, you can also get profiled steel shuttering, which looks very much like this, that you can use as permanent shuttering and then you cast your concrete deck on top of it. And that's a really good system because once you've got that steel deck down in your building for your floors, then the, the contractors, the operatives can walk on it. So you've made it safe, then they can pour the concrete on it, they don't need to prop it, while it's curing, there's no form work to put up, take down, because you just leave that steel deck in place once the concrete's cast. And that's not what this building is, but just you know, just worth mentioning that. Okay, so there's our deck. Across there. And these these M profile decks, they come with with products, little trims that you, you put on the end. Just to kind of strengthen the um, the end condition. Okay. Okay, so that's like that. And we got here we've got so we've then got an insulated, oh no it's not. The insulation in this, in this instance, the insulation is, is within the depth of this profiled sheet. So it's actually a, it's actually a composite product. Okay. So you buy this as a, as a pre-insulated plank. I think that's what this is. So in fact, the top, top of the product would be up here. And then what they've actually got here, which is kind of slightly unusual in a way, is they've got a plywood packer, a substantial bit of probably two, two sheets of plywood. Mm -hmm. Which they're then using to pack out to form the top of the glazing and then at the head of the, the glazing we've got the 
similar product to the, that we had at the bottom. And, oops, drawing's gone a bit wrong there. So the, the head of the head of those glass planks sits in that channel at the top. Okay. And then we know that they want the trim sorry, the trim at the top is flush. So this is the zinc, the zinc roof, and what that does is they've got a plywood. They've actually got a plywood deck to sit that zinc on, uh, which I've not drawn a bit. It's on a, it's just on a slight angle there, just to shed the rain. So that's the that's the plywood. And the standing seam zinc roof is fitted directly onto that. And it's it's standing seams, so you see these, these standing seams. I'll just colour that zinc in there. Um, that's the shadow gap that they, that they wanted there, that they created. And it doesn't really show on my detail, to be honest, but I suspect they've probably just got, well, either aluminium or timber hackers in here. Just to create that slight angle on the roof, which I forgot to draw. Okay, And that would also work because it would give a a ventilation zone underneath that that plywood sheet just to keep it all dry let's finish this off here. Um, that's our insulated steel roof So if I just show you the picture again. So that's the that's the detail that we've drawn. The the zinc just coming over the top. Um, the aluminium trim at the top of the, the glazing. A little shadow gap. I mean on the on the picture it looks tiny, but on the detail, it looks like about 50 millimeters, okay? And then very sort of similar detail at the bottom. And again, it's one of those details where when you just look at the building, it's all very kind of simple, very elegant. But as we've, as we've kind of demonstrated through drawing the detail, uh, it only achieves that simplicity with some real care about lining things through shadow gaps, avoiding uh, sort of projecting trims. Okay, let's just finish off the bottom here. So the only, the only other bit that I've not drawn is the, the wood chip acoustic product, which is just face fixed to the concrete down here, and that appears, from looking at the pictures, it appears to be just fixed with a 
shot fired or a screw fixed um, fixing there and a, a little galvanized steel disc which is just expressed and it just fixes that in place um, and actually what I will do since I've started it I'll just complete this little bit of the section in the other direction so we've got oh, I've drawn my um, I've drawn my timber packers the wrong direction okay they should be they should be sloping up the roof really so they would actually be probably be what you'd call furrings so furring is just a piece of wood which is cut on an angle okay yeah um, why must it be that way rather than this way um you can still choose the same effect yeah that's the only thing i was thinking whether the air might flow better with it pointing the other way oh, yeah. yeah i mean i have to say i'm making this bit up because the detail i've got doesn't <laughs> It just shows it floating, so I don't really know. They may not have gone for timber, they may have used aluminium. But yeah, I mean, you're right, you could just have different. I mean, that's the, that's the great thing about using timber, you can just cut it on site. It's simple. Um, plywood deck. Top of there. Well, this really, it, it appears to be uninsulated. The walls appear to be uninsulated. Um, I'm guessing, I don't really know, but maybe because the doors are open all the time, there's maybe just not a lot of point. Mm -hmm. um, so, with the insulation in the roof, in the roof is that just sort of in terms of not getting wet moisture or it, something? It might be about condensation, yeah. If you've got, you know, if you've got very cold air outside or snow on the roof, it would, yeah. Um, I mean, I have to say, again, my detail, it, it's kind of unclear about whether there is insulation in the roof. I'm slightly guessing on that. Um, but certainly when you look at the interior, they don't appear to have insulated the walls. Uh, I mean, you could, you know, you could criticise that and say, but, you know, what if on a really cold winter's day, you're repairing trains, you've got all the doors shut, you're trying to get a bit of heat into that space, and the walls have no insulation. Um, I mean, I, I, it would still be warm outside. It, yeah, yeah. But I mean, when you were there, was it really cold? Uh, it, the week after you were there, yeah, it wasn't. Was it, it was not? pretty cold, wasn't it? But yeah. yeah but when we were there, you know, it was minus the five. Was pretty much gone. Right. You know, I, I imagine, yeah, working in this train shed when it's minus five outside, they, I mean, they might have some space heating. I don't know, some radiant heating, but yeah. I mean, I, I'm assuming that product on the inside, it doesn't, doesn't look like an insulation product to me. It looks like an acoustic, sorry, this, this board here. But certainly the walls, they're not cast. I mean, what they often do in Switzerland is cast it as two, uh, two independent concrete walls, and then you can put insulation down the middle. But they, they don't appear to have done that on this building. Finish off this um, standing scene roof. So it's a zinc, a zinc sheet, and that would be crimped over itself onto the next sheet to give a completely watertight standing scene like that. Okay. So that's pretty much it. I can't fit it on the all on at once, but um, anybody got any questions? Yeah. Oh yeah, I haven't finished that. Yeah, okay. good point. Yeah, super glue at the moment. Just yeah, yeah, good point. Okay, so yeah, okay. What they appear to have is a slightly odd detail this, but here to have is an aluminium, sorry, a, a plywood packer in here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So they appear to have a plywood, like a, like a, you know, probably two sheets of plywood fixed together, which I guess is partly just giving uh, 
a sort of solid um, back backdrop here to fix these aluminium um, trims to trim to, and the the reglet the channel that the reglet sits in appears to be just bolt fixed into that plywood, and then the plywood. So I am, again, I'm slightly making this up because what I've got is a bit, a bit different. It's fixed with, with two steel angles. So there's a steel angle here, like this, fixing that in place. And I'm going to do this. There's a Sorry, let's figure this out. Steel angle in here. So it's a bit of a, you know, they just kind of use various bits of steel angle to get that load back to the to the main steel. Um, I mean, it doesn't show it here, but. I would have thought there'd be some sort of fixing into the top of the concrete as well. I, mean, I would have, I would have expected to see a little steel angle at the base here. Um, but I mean, again, with this, you know, with the sort of no insulation concept, it, it's a sort of peculiar detail because you there's no, you know, there's no thermal break in here. It's just a, a continuous path for heat through the plywood. But it, you know, it appears that they're not. They're not too concerned about that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what they're showing here. Anybody got any any questions? Anybody using steel steel frame? No. Um, okay. Anybody using concrete? Yeah. One person, two people, yeah. Nobody else has any concrete? Yeah. A little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. But, yeah. So I hope, you know, I hope what... One thing I'd like to sort of take from looking at this building is this idea that you, you can make great architecture from very simple elements you know in this case it's a shed it's got some concrete walls and it has a structure and you get some really good light through it and you know in my view it doesn't matter whether you're making a a library or you're making a train shed the important thing is that people will work in it people will spend a large part of their life in it and around it and looking at it and so you know hopefully as an architect You'll do everything you can to make that the best possible work environment for those people. Um, and, you know, that's the nature of a lot of buildings is people spend years and years of their life in it. And, and so that's, you know, that's part of our, our role. Okay. okay, great. Well, let's, we've finished early, but let's, um, let's stop there, shall we? Yes. Yeah.